I bought my very first home in Philadelphia from Robert. Too many of our people just drop the ball and they're not taught how to preserve wealth. They're taught how to make money. Fortunately, a lot of them are taught to be rich, but a lot of them aren't taught to preserve wealth. Short-term rental, mid-term rental, laws that change. You know, what's your opinion of the short-term rental business now or mid-term rental business? And if you were advising me as to, you know, is it a good, a good idea to get into that business? And if so, where and where not? First, explain to somebody in one minute what a sheriff's sale is. What's happened? How did you end up like, you know, buying and selling houses and owning rental properties? And, you know, how did you get into that? Hey guys, thank you for watching the Real Estate Doctor podcast. If you get value from this episode, which I know you will, please hit the subscribe button, like it, comment, do your thing. Welcome to the Real Estate Doctor podcast, where I'm going to educate, inspire, and definitely today, entertain you. <laughs> so today I have a special guest, and first off, let me set the scene here. We are in Aruba, as usual but we are at the Men of Means Mastermind, which is the mastermind that I'm part of. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to several people in different podcasts that are here because they're great, amazing men. Uh, and the first and foremost one is a longtime friend, brother from another mother, mm -hmm. Robert Nunez. Thanks, Thank brother, you. for being on here. Thank you, brother, for having me. Thank you for that warm intro. Okay. So let me tell you guys a little bit about Robert. Uh, Robert has 25 years of experience in real estate, and I'll tell you a fun fact you probably didn't know. Um, and Robert is in the corporate short-term, mid-term rental business. Um, he is now into boutique hotels, ground-up development, hotel development, and through one of his companies, he has over 2,900 doors in corporate, mm -hmm. corporate rentals. He's also the president of our mastermind group, which... Mm -hmm. Behind, uh, behind the cameras here, so you know, are like <laughs> 15 guys taking pictures, and so there's no pressure here. Um, so he's the president. We just got done day one of our mastermind, which has really been amazing, and I'm super grateful for it. So um, let me start, you know, Robert, with my first amazing fact for a lot of people is I bought my very first home in Philadelphia from Robert, and... Um, I'll tell a little story about that home. You know, I went to a real estate meeting, which I always tell you guys you should go to, um, in Wilmington, Delaware. And the speaker was Robert. And I was actually in college. And I, I had created an investment club with other college guys. And we all put in money. And, you know, we thought we were saving money for a down payment. And here comes Robert saying that I can buy a done and finished house for $35,000 in Philadelphia, this is probably in 2002 or three or something like that. So you can't get those kind of houses now. Um, so uh, I was like, dude, I'm in. And uh, so Robert took me to the first time to a fully Latin community in Philadelphia <laughs> where no one spoke English. Uh, and he had a little bit of a <laughs> he had a little bit of an in there. Um, and so I bought my first house from Robert and from Robert uh, doing that. Over the last 20 years, we've stayed in touch, and, and we'll, we'll go through that. But, Robert, um, thank you for being on the show. Um, what I, I'd like you to start with is, you know, maybe, you know, a little bit of your background. He's smoking a cigar, and the cigar is a special cigar. I'm going to smoke one, too. It's actually his cigar. He is of Cuban descent, and he's representing, and he got into the, uh, the business. So um, I'll let Robert talk a little bit about you know, how he came from just selling me a house to this big, big mogul, you know, doing hotels and, and, you know, multi-million, multi-million, million dollar deals. So Robert, if you want to give a little bit of your backdrop and your story, go for it. I mean, my brother, after that introduction, I'm just like, well, who is he? Like, hey, <laughs> um, well, the, the real estate journey for me began with, with my mom, you know, in Los Angeles, um, she came from Cuba in 1971 at the age of 1920. And um, they knocked on the door, you know, to collect the rent. There was, they weren't paying rent in Cuba back at that time, she tells me. And they knocked on the door to pick up the rent. And she opened the door 
at my aunt, my granddad's house and says, yes. And the guy says, hey, I'm here to pick up the rent. And she was like, what's that? And the guy's like, you know, once a month we pick up the rent for a living here. And she says, I got to pay you to live here? And he was like, yeah. And she was like, oh, no, no, no. That doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> so she decided, coming from modest means, so, you know, start getting into being a homeowner and bought, you know, whatever she felt she could afford at that time. Well, hold on a minute. Yeah. So for her to be confused about rent, that's because she came from Cuba where you don't have rent. At, in her experience, they weren't paying rent. Right. Right. You know, and so this was just like a whole new scenario. She was like, this doesn't work because I'm <laughs> going to be living forever, paying somebody forever. Uh -huh. Right. That was just, you know, the, uh, the analogy of how she put it together. Yeah. So she started looking into buying her own home and that little lesson stood with her. So as we were growing up, we wound up moving from different places like Los Angeles. We lived in Atlanta, we lived in Miami, lived in Newark, New Jersey, Jersey City. Um, I spent a lot of my older time in New York and as well as in Philadelphia. And she would just wind up buying the cheapest houses in predominantly the worst neighborhoods, you know, because cheaper was better, right? And, <laughs> you know, yeah, I agree to disagree with her, right? You know, right. Uh, and then, um, and we saw that growing up. And the beautiful thing about it is that um, my mom, um, rest, rest in her soul, is she taught, us, she taught us the gift of vision because we would move into the empty abandoned house and the kids, you know, kids are hard, right? Kids are tough. They would make jokes and crack on us. Hey, you live in a haunted house, you live in a crack house, whatever they wanted to call it. And it was hot. it was kind of rough. But living in this house and going to school and then coming back and then there was a window and then the next day I come back and there's another window. And then on the road, when they made some money, we came back, there was water, right? You know, taking a bath in a, in a, it's called a cubeta. It's like this, a big metal bucket. You would get in in the morning and then she would pour hot water. And then you pour it, you rinse down, you get dressed and you go to school. And um, wow. that, that was, you know, part of me and my sister's childhood. There's three of us. But what that did is, which I didn't know then is, she taught me the gift of vision. Because now when I would drive around at an older age and see abandoned properties, I didn't see an abandoned house. I saw us taking a shower in the bucket or coming home to a window because I already knew what it was going to be because I lived there. I already saw family playing and having a Christmas or Thanksgiving there because we did. I just know that it had to just get to that point. So that, so her raising us like that, you know, definitely instilled that in me. That, that is, I mean, and you know, I've known Robert for 20 years. I've never heard that story. That is unbelievable to, to see how you, have gone from that to where you are now. And, and I, I know you over the years and I, I know there's been, you know, struggles that you've gone through. And um, so keep with the story, you know, how did you go from that? How, maybe your first property, what you started in real estate doing, right. you know, what was, what went good with that? What went bad with that? Yeah. Well, you know, as, as you're growing older, I was interested in real estate because she was guiding us to like, yeah, you got to have something. Her formula was um, you got to have something before you go or you got to have something you can call your own. And she had this philosophy, which she said, if you have a roof over your head, you'll be always be able to get back on your feet. You know, so like you could always regroup yourself as a person if you come home and gather yourself and then, you know, go back out and fight another day. So that was always important. That was on a roof over your head. Then we come as our generation and we multiply that as, you know, many roofs over many people's heads. But that was her formula. Um, she sold some property in Jersey City. And this is something a lot of people go through, right? So they buy cheap. Um, let's say they bought at 20000 right? And then if she sold at 80000 she's like, oh, my God, I made $60,000. But that was over a couple of years, right? And then the barrier, then she goes back in to buy, but the new buying price is 100000 So she really lost twenty, right? Because now she can't afford to go back into the market where she sold from. So then she had to get up and go to the next lower neighborhood <laughs> because she also didn't know the value of leveraging credit money you know, that didn't really, that wasn't predominantly important in that household. So we would go to the next city and then she wound up, you know, finding a way to Camden, New Jersey. And then from there, we wound up finding, you know, myself, I found myself to Philadelphia, which is right across the water. Um, and when I got to Philly, I saw the same things that I saw in Jersey City and Newark and in New York, which is like, you know, subway station, parks, brownstone, row homes, you know, homes. And I was like, airports, arenas. And I said, this is this was like in 2003. I'm like, this has the same makings of back home. It's just not there yet. So, you know, and then I started my investment journey there. I bought a sheriff's sale property um, for $3,500, which I still own to today. No, no way. Yeah. Yeah. So I bought a share. Actually, we, we own 
all of them on that little row. Like, yeah, okay. And- so hold on, let me stop there. So you bought a share. Your first property was a share of sale property for thirty five hundred dollars. First, explain to somebody in one minute what a share of sale is. Oh, um, in Philadelphia, when a person doesn't pay their taxes or the municipal liens, debts to the city or to a bank, but normally more to the city, they can force your property to be sold because you know you owe. So they're going to force your house to auction, and this normally starts off at the price of what you owe. And then people bid on it. And then you could wind up, they buy it, they buy the deed and then you're in the, you know, they come and they take the property. Right. And so, but I bought an abandoned property. Nobody lived there. So I bought um, a two family for 3,500 bucks. So you bought a, a duplex. A duplex, yes. For two units and one deed for 3,500. How much money, you know, must have needed work, right? Yeah, it was, it was a total, it was a total shell. Okay. Right. So we bought the, we bought the property. And when I say we, it's because you know, I had people that were helping me, but I, I bought it. And I went in, I did some painting and some work. And then a lady came and said, hey, I want to build a salon in here. And I said, okay. And then I said, well, she said, well, what do you want for it? I said, I want 9000 Because in my mind, I'm like, I bought it for $3,500. i am selling it for $9,000. i am making $5,500. i am just getting in. $5,500 to me is like, wow. Uh-huh. I double plus my money, right? You and- wanted $9,000 for what? For rent? No, she was. I was selling it for her for nine grand because okay. it was it was really in bad condition. But I bought it for thirty five hundred, and it happened like a couple of weeks later. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I made off, right? And um, so she gives me as she said, "Well, what's the deposit?" And I said, thirty five hundred. <laughs> so she, you wanted your thirty five hundred back. <laughs> so she gives me thirty five hundred. Yeah. She goes on this handwritten mortgage payment plan that I created and notarized, right at a auto tag agency. I really didn't know anything. Yeah, but how, how did you even know that at that time? Well, I knew she owed me fifty five hundred. So, you know, I was like, well, you owe me 5500 for this amount of month, and you're going to pay me, you know, $420. I just created it, man. I'm not even going to do it. Created it. I just created it. I love it. it. I yeah. love it. You didn't know. You stepped into it. You created it. That's amazing. And she paid up to about five grand, and then she defaulted. So then we got the house back. <laughs> okay. So you, you got the house back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so wait a minute. So your first house, you bought for 3500 you sold it for like nine. You became a lender. Yeah. So in your like what? Yeah, first month, that. you had become a real estate investor and a lender. Yeah, yeah. I never thought uh, about it like on that. On a yeah. sheet of paper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Okay. So now what did you do with the property when you took it back? Um, it sat there for a while. Amazing story, right? It sat there for a while. And then it was decaying. And then eventually, the, the city came and they had to knock it down. The two family. So, but I kept a lot, right? I kept the last That's because everybody owned it. So they knocked it down, and it's, it, the story has an amazing twist. So I not, they, they knocked it down, then they billed me 13000 13800 Okay, hold on. A lot of people don't understand. So, you know, if, if you have a vacant, like, what do they call it? Blighted property Blighted. in a lot of cities. Disrepair. You know, the, the, the municipality can come and knock your building down and then bill you, you know, and it isn't like they did it on a cheap you know, I'd like those contracts to knock down the houses. So third, I saw one where I, it was like 51000 yeah. But anyway, so you get, so now you bought this for 3500 The lady gave you like 5000 yeah. So you're up 1500 But now you're down because you got a $13,000 lien against it. Right. Now I'm in the negative. Okay. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I, now I owe $13,000 on a property that I'm, that's a lot now, right? But I, I just sat on it. I let it go. And then, you know, we just started investing in real estate, which then we went. And met you, but to go back to that lot story to close it in full circle, that was in 2000. We were already in 2006 at this point. Um, as of the end of last year, 2023, we now own the next lots to it, and uh, that we're rezoning it to build an apartment building, which is uh, 16 units and four stores. So, so this lot uh-huh. you bought now. All one, these other lots. I started buying the houses and the lots right next to it. And then we're going to rezone that and come up with an apartment building. Crazy. Yeah. And I'm glad I kept the lot. Yeah. The okay. 13 grand is actually a good deal now when I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Now, cool. I wasn't, wasn't then. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now, interesting first house story. So how did you, what, what else happened? How did you end up like, you know, buying and selling houses and owning rental properties and, you know, how did you get into that? Well, once I bought that first house at the sheriff's sale, I went back to the sheriff's sale because I'm like, well, this is where you buy houses at, right? You, you bid and you give a little bit down and <laughs> they, were, they were so cheap. So I go back to the sheriff's sale and I bought, the, I bought literally I bought 
two houses over from that first one. So I already had kind of two out of two out of those I already had within like the first year and a half because the other one became for sale on the sheriff's sale. That was up in structure running, you know. So I bought the first one, then I bought the next two over adjacent. I bought that one. We fixed that and rented it. Everything in sheriff's sale. Yeah. Now right. were they all like terrible properties or like properties? They were rough. In, they were, they rough. were rough. Yeah. They need none of them were ready to go. They needed work, you know. And then so what happened is I hired a contractor to do that second house, right? Uh, uh, and I was like, hey, a guy named Jose. Oh, right. Where'd you get the money? I had a little bit of money because it, it was the contract was only back then. It was it wasn't much. It was probably like sixty eight hundred dollars to do the work, you know. So I put the money together, and um, so I hired a contractor to do the work. He did a good job. Then I come back. I go back to New York and I start telling all my friends, "Hey, listen, I bought this house for, you know, the second house. I bought the second house for ten, um, with a, with a friend who invested with me, and we got the contract to fix it. So now I'm in New York telling people, "Hey, you know, we bought these properties and this is how much we paid for it: sixteen grand, seventeen grand, all in." And people just didn't believe me. So then people started like, "Hey, I want to know how you do this and so forth." And literally right there, I stopped talking. I'm like, "Wait a minute, like this doesn't make <laughs> ding, 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 yeah, ding, I was ding. like this doesn't make like they're too excited." <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I started spreading the word and we started playing this game called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cash Flow. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The name of it. Ca cash, cash Flow. flow. I yeah, think it's called Cash Flow. Yeah, yeah. Cash right? Yeah. So we started playing this game in group settings. We used to play at the Sony building on 55th Street. You know, we started playing in, in New York. Yeah. yeah. We started playing and then we organized like a presentation and told people you can come to Philadelphia and, um, you can buy properties, you know, via the sheriff's cell, and we have contractors. We'll fix them, and then you know we can manage them. So then people started coming through with us on these buses, and we were doing these presentations around, which is like where I met you, right? And people would buy properties, and they would hire us to fix them, and then you know we would save the proceeds from the construction, whatever we made, and then reinvest and buy more properties. Okay, now I have a lot of questions. So, um, first off, from the from the time that you bought these the first property to the time that you go ding, 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 there's an opportunity. There is a, a, um, and I, I, there's a word I used to come. There is a, a need in, in New York. It got, it was more expensive than Philadelphia. Yeah. And when you say, and still to the day, you know, Philadelphia is more expensive than New York. And a lot of people in New York can't invest because it's so expensive to get into the game. Um, so from the time you did the first property to when you recognized, you know, I can sell these properties, you know, and, mm -hmm. and do the construction and this, that, and the other thing. What time period was that? Um, when the contractor was finishing, I'm going to probably say 90 days, you know, because he, 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 he it was like a two or three month job. So he worked at the house for like about two months. And then, you know, while talking to friends and stuff and they're getting excited. So literally after buying the first property, like within 90 days, we already were preparing okay. like these tours. You bought you bought the first property and 90... Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The second, the second property, the contract. I apologize. Okay. Second property. Well, go back to the first property. Okay. How long from the first property to like, hey, now you're selling property in New York? Oh, um, nine to 11 months. Maybe. Okay. Nine so in a year, mm -hmm. you know, you had just stepped into being like a real estate developer, basically. In your first month... You bought a property at a tax sale. You owned a property. You became a lender. And then in 12 months, you now became a real estate developer. Yeah. Because right. you saw all the need. Yeah. Okay. Now, most important question. In your sales, what number was I? One, two, five, 20? Great was question. I like your third sale? Because I never I, asked I think, him this. You know, that's a great question, right? We've talked about that. I, you, I was always the one who sold you first. I think you were probably like my third or fourth sale. No. Yeah, I we can't really. Believe. So we really came up on this journey and like that together, right? Yeah, I, I man, I unbelievable. You my, yeah, but you, you, I got, I got to give it to you, man. You had a good presentation. You were tight. You know, the house was nice. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a good deal. It was a good deal. It was a good deal yeah, it was a good deal. done and rented. I should have kept it. <laughs> you know, I was going to ask you some of those beginning houses. You know, what would they be worth today? Mm. Um, and I don't. Do you remember the street you yeah. sold me? I know the address. No, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna say it right, you okay. know, for whatever purpose, but, but yeah. What would that house sell for today? I don't, I no longer own it. The investment club right. didn't make money on it. I think we, yeah, we yeah, sold it to some twice, right? Yeah, <laughs> twice. Um, that, that house is probably worth about like 129 to 159, roughly. Bought it for 35. Yeah, wow. Um, 
Tremendous. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, how many, how many, you know, you did a bunch of deals, mm-hmm. you know, for a period of time. How did you end up in, you know, on the other side of yeah. the real estate world, which is like where you are, well, yeah. somewhat where you are now, which is the corporate Midterm, short term, and everybody Airbnb. That's what everybody says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, you right. don't. Yeah, you don't like to call it that. Well, because it's bigger than that. Right. right okay. Yeah. So, how did you end up in that? And you know, yeah. So let's start with that. All right. So once we picked up a, a portfolio of properties, and we were renting, we didn't really have great management experience ourselves. So you know, we had a lot of tenant issues, and I just didn't want to deal with tenants. So I'm in New York one day, and a friend of mine says. Hey, why don't you air? It's 2013. So we're 10 years in on the real estate owning side and fixing, right? We built a portfolio of regular rentals. We're thinking that three, four, five, six hundred bucks a month net cash flow per unit is great. You know, and a friend of mine says, Hey, why don't you Airbnb? And I said, 2013. And I said, What's that? So the question she asked me was life changing. My question to her was life altering. Like, it really just opened everything. She said, why don't you Airbnb? And then I said, what's that? And she said, oh, she shows me on her phone. And I was like, wow. So then I go quickly and I take some pictures with my my phone of my apartment. And I create a listing in, in, in Queens. How long from when she mentioned that to you doing that? Next day. Next day. Yeah. Now, I, I will say, I know when Robert's birthday is a day before mine. And we're both Aries, and and <laughs> this is how Aries roll. <laughs> yeah. Like you know, you give us an idea. The next day, we're gonna try the idea. Go Aries. Yeah. Well, you know what? Why? Why? Why, why not? Let, yeah. Why not? Why let it go to sleep? Because then what will happen is right. Life kicks in, and then you forget those opportunities, and then you be like, ah, something else comes up. No. So I felt it. It was like the ding, ding, ding moment. I created a listing in about forty-eight hours. I got a booking, and my daughter, loved me incredibly, was with me when my first guest showed up into our my first. Airbnb, my first guest showed up. Two girls were coming to a, a, um, a show in Brooklyn. And they show up, and my daughter's standing there, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, hello. Never did it before. <coughs> right? So I'm like, hello. And they checked in. And then she looks at me, and she said, well, where are we going to go, Daddy? And I was like, I don't know, let's go somewhere. Right? We got money now. <laughs> so we took the money. So we took the money, and we went out, and we did something. You know, I think we went back to one of, one of our, our properties. And um, that... Next and the, within the next two weeks, I wound up getting like three or four more reservations. Right, that's when things were just moving with Airbnb, and I saw the reservations coming in, coming in, coming in, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And in one month, I wound up paying uh, two months of rent. And I'm like, "Wait a minute, this this is like the ROI is great, right?" And then ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, "Wait a minute, why don't I just rent more apartments and do this, <laughs> right?" And yeah. and then I just went into I started renting apartments and then putting them back on the platform and you know going from there. That led to converting what we own into short-term rentals, uh, renting properties into short-term rentals, and just, you know, not looking back. Okay. So would you say now the majority of your properties are that you own are short-term rentals? No, because we're still, some of them aren't short-term rental friendly where they're at. Okay. But a lot of them that are, are. So, you know, it's a good balance. Okay. Good balance. So- you know, there's a lot of like um, short-term rental, mid-term rental laws that change. You know, what's your opinion of the short-term rental, you know, business now or mid-term rental business? And if you were advising me as to, you know, is it a good a good idea to get into that business? And if so, where and where not? Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay. It's fantastic. You know, um, with the laws changing... People complain to say, hey, it's not like it used to be. So what? Nothing is like it used to be, right? So instead of, you know, trying to change the course of history or fighting an uphill battle, just, you know, learn how to make a profit and learn how to make money in the gray space. If your market requires regulations and change the laws, navigate within the law. If you're mad because your property doesn't fit into the law, then get another property, you know, or just don't do it. But, you know, don't gripe about it. It's not The griping doesn't change. Um if you're going to go into that space, you want to go into a market where they, where there is already existing permits and licenses allowed. Some people say, oh, well, you know, I've been in the city of New Mexico, you know, just an example, and there's no permits required. Well, that's not good because that can change. But if they already have, uh, like in Miami, Miami proper, right? If they already allow it and you get a permit, that's a good market to go to because then you can actually get 
premise to run the business. You know, even though Miami is a little bit saturated market, but so it's a great business. Um, it is a business. It's not, I'm going to just get a unit, sit back and nothing happens. You could do that with one, two, three, four, five units, but you know, we have a very large portfolio. So we actually have a full team, full system. You've been to our office. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a real operation, but it's fantastic. It's fa okay. I love so, it. so explain to me what corporate housing is. Yeah. Corporate housing is businesses, corporations, um, and C-suite executives, people in the business world renting your housing. So it's kind of like Airbnb for business, right? Or short-term rental for business to use for a better sense. So why, why, why would a business want to rent from you? Well, because there's a shift. So for example, credibility. So you don't just get a unit and just say, hey, I'm a corporate rental. Like we have established relationship with these companies. We serve them. We've been vetted. You know, they've checked us, they've checked us out. They've worked with us. So, you know, um, insurance companies will use us. You know, something happens at a place, they'll send them to your place. So corporate rental is requires a little more of a business presence and a little more navigation. So, I, well, I mean, I, even if I had like one or two properties, it wouldn't work for me because they need more yeah. units, right? Yeah, so corporate rental traditionally, not always true, but traditionally they require more because they come with more inventory, but they are corporate rentals that just take one off. The, the manager, the CEO, or the VP likes the place and they take it, but corporate rentals is the way to go. That money is solid. Okay. I got a couple questions, you know, and, and Robert is like really one of my closest friends and near and dear to my heart, especially in the mastermind. And believe it or not, we really don't talk too much about like, the, the and we talked about, we need to do more, understand what each other are doing, yeah. you know, because when we talk, like he's like my, my oldest son's favorite guy. And, you know, it's, it's more like friendship. Um, so somebody, you know, I've heard you in the mastermind talk about, uh, a couple things. So, you know, uh, when there are conventions like the Republican or democratic convention, like what kind of opportunities are there for like somebody like you to house people? And like, what kind of money is that like massive? Um, that's massive. So last year, uh, we had our biggest client, which was a uh, part of a government client and they were running a government, I'm going to say a government program, right? That's the most I can say about it, in a, several major cities. And we wound up housing them in several major cities. And we generated what it would have taken us a year or two to do in, in our regular business. We generated it in like 90 days because we had enough inventory to meet their needs. So it was like they booked a bunch of hotels in different cities, but they were actually our units or people that we partnered with. Okay. I was going to say, but I mean, did you have all the units? For them, like you yourself? When they came to me, no. But when they came to me and they told me what they needed, I went and I found it. I okay. said yes. And I was like, let me get right back to you. Okay. And then I went to work. So, guys, the beauty of this guy, and I'm going to get a little bit more into the mindset, the mind. Like, I feel like that movie, like, The Beautiful Mind, the mindset that this guy has is out of control. Like, you know, so, and you're always talking about leveling up, you know, and it's like, okay, if I just did in 90 days what I would do in two years, then why can't I do that all the time, yeah. right? Now, these are not my words. These are his words that he said to us today. So talk a little bit more about that and, and you know, how your mind works, which I think is intriguing. Um, well, once, once we got those checks for that client within that 90-day window and I saw the numbers, I said to myself, man, it would have taken us this long to do it. So the first thing, the first thing that my mind did was, was like, well, it was a one-off. I got lucky. Right. You know, yeah. because, you know, oh, I got lucky. It's not going to happen again, uh -huh. which then taught me, like, why do I think it's luck? It was it was just real work. And if this client exists, then why am I not finding more clients like that? And why won't I get this client to return? So I had to shift from like, oh, this isn't normal to the saying This is my normal. This is your new normal. Yeah, this is my new normal, my new set point. So if this is my new normal. Once I made the decision that that wasn't luck, and like this is where I want to operate in. Instantly like milliseconds, I started recognizing where I could find it, which blew my mind because it was always there. I just wasn't recognizing it because I was in operating mode because I was operating at a certain comfort level. And once this one came in and disrupted it, I was like, wait a minute, this is fantastic. And then I was like, why isn't this well, not? I said, why am I not making this all the time? And then I, then I changed the question. I said, how do I keep, how do I keep making this? And the minute I asked that, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I could ask their opposing party. Right. 
And then I said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, because it was a government, right? So, you know, there was a one branch of government. So then I said, uh, right. right. So I was like, wait a minute, but they have a competitor. So let me go to the competitor, <laughs> right? And how's them? And then it just started leading into one thing to another. And um, it was fantastic. So should I ask who you're voting no, for? I didn't need to do that. So. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, go ahead. So, all right. So is there something like who is the who is the best person that can you can service uh, in business? Like I, I know you, you can service a man, you know, and we're going to talk about the mastermind after this. But before I leave your business and what you do, you know, what is your ideal? I don't even know if you take customers. Uh, what would what's your ideal customer um, and who can you help? The most. Fantastic. Great. Um, I'm at a fortunate point in my life now where my ideal client is multi-unit apartment building owners who don't want to deal with a ton of headaches anymore. And they actually want to convert all of the units into short and midterm rentals because we operate on a hotel mentality platform. So we actually have taken several buildings and we have the whole entire property from first level to the fifth, sixth, tenth level. And everything there. So we basically created like hybrid boutique hotels. We call them resi tells. So every unit in the property is a short-term rental or a midterm rental. There's no tenants anymore. And uh, we operate because that eliminates problems for the owners. It creates a higher revenue. And uh, we, it's an easier operation for us because we operate it as like a ho semi-hotel. So how do they find you and how do you find them or vice versa? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, they can uh, find us at livingquarters.net. That's our corporate site. Right, L I V I N G Q quarters, like a you know, flip a coin. We'll put it in the yeah, description. Great. Livingquarters.net or co host expert company. Okay. Co and how, and t to be clear, these are like you multi, you know, buildings of how many units or like what, what, and give me like, uh, I just wasn't clear on how many unit buildings. Like, you know, somebody that has a hundred uh, unit building should call you. Yeah, they can. Absolutely. And, and you are going to solve what problem for them? Loss of rent through tenant eviction, destruction of property to tenant damages, uh, excessive excessive bills through you know excessive usage, um, more peace of mind. You know, there's going to be people that counter and say, yeah, but these things also happen when you have guests and so forth. We have a we have a very streamlined system. You're gonna you can't have a hundred units and I have little hiccups here and there, but operating a hundred unit hybrid hotel or resi tel is way more peace of mind in operating 100 unit full of tenants. Okay. It's a, different, it's a different market altogether. And as an owner, your numbers change, right? Because now you're now you're bringing in like a, a lower vacancy ratio. So your, your numbers look better. So your refinance and, and money you want to raise towards your property, you have better chances because and the value of your in. property goes up. And your value goes up. So your ref we have people that they were making X amount. And then after a while, they started making more because of being with us for two or three years and their value went up. So they, hit, they got more money at the refinance. And it's a great, it's a great symbiotic relationship. Tremendous. Is there, well, I know you're, you're like buying hotels and stuff like yeah. that now too. So, um, you know, let's say I want to be part of the party. I want to own a hotel. You know, can I call you and get in on it? Or like, or is it like only Cubans only? <laughs> <laughs> Which you're totally yeah. not like that. I'm just being Yeah, funny. I know, but that's actually funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Communist, have, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, we have a um, we have an appetite to work with investors because since we manage the properties, we understand the entire dynamic of it and we know our industry. So we do have an appetite for investors. There's a couple of deals that we have right now, um, boutique type properties, uh, 32, over 90, um, where we would actually work with investors. Hey, listen, this is what we're doing. You know, want to okay. get in on it? So yeah. people can reach out to you. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Is there anything in your, because I'm going to go to the mastermind and how much that means to me and you. Yes. You know, is there anything in your business that maybe I, I missed? Um, oh, yeah. We are, we are, we're on a construction company, full service. <laughs> yeah. Because we had to, right? Because right. we have so many doors that. And where, where, what are your markets? Got it. Um, Philadelphia, well, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and now we're venturing into upstate New York. Okay. Right. And uh, the name of the company is called Pro Turn Construction. And what we do is we provide immediate turnover of units. So here's what happens. A lot of multifamily development companies, owners and REITs, 
they have sitting inventory because they don't have enough people to turn it over. Okay. Labor so shortage. turnover, mm -hmm. define a turnover. Not everybody knows I'm what it's Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, a turnover is when somebody moves out and you got to get it rent ready for the next person to come in. So, our team so you're in. saying, so some of these bigger buildings, mm -hmm. they have vacancies. They wouldn't have a vacancy if they could turn the unit over. They could get somebody in there to fix the unit fast. Right. But there's just not enough people for them or they don't know who those people are. There's not enough reliable them. people. There's not reliable. There's people. not enough fully insured people. Okay. See, I'm a, we are fully insured company up and running straight up. So there's no cutting corners. We come in, you know, you have 14, you know, say you have a hundred unit building, you got six vacancies. We come in, we're like, okay, let's get the work done. We're in and out in two, three weeks. Now you got six rentals ready to go. Yep. Yeah. So I that's, know. that's the other part. I, n I never saw that that could be a problem for a bigger property owner. Yeah. Um, labor shortage and um, quality of work and insurance really. Okay. Um, Cause you leveled up, right? Now you're dealing with a different type of client. They, they don't want to deal with people that they just grab in the street. Now, these microphones are great, but I don't know if they're going to deal with a Harley going down the road. You know, yeah. so repeat what you so, were saying. So you leveled up, right? You leveled up to a different type of client. And once you level up to a different type of client, um, the tuition to deal with that client is these bills you have to pay, insurance, workman comp, you know, full staff, because they're going to give you the business, but you got to be able to meet their demand and you got to pay within their scope. That's why a lot of companies don't make it. They just don't want to pay the tuition to play at this level. So they can't just hire Johnny at Home Depot standing out front. They wouldn't. The liability yeah. is too great. I know. Yeah, they would. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Okay. So let's talk. So Robert is, first off, what cigar? This is a, mm -hmm. I like mild cigars. What's the name of your cigar? And how did you end up <laughs> owning a cigar? Yeah. Um, the name of the cigar is called Puro Fuego, which uh, in Spanish means pure fire. Which is pure fire? fire? Yeah. First off, I know enough Spanish that I should know that. Yeah, I know. Hey, yeah. I, don't I, know I never know. put that together, but that sounds better in English, I'd say. Yeah, pure But fire. maybe not. Maybe not. Puro fuego. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so puro fuego. Maybe I means... can't say it like you. <laughs> puro fuego, because you don't drag your R. <laughs> I cannot roll <laughs> my R. I tried. Right? I sat on the beach. La, 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 my, I just can't. <laughs> cannot do it. So it's pure. It's called puro fuego. Um, it's a cigar that was created about going on two years ago. And, um, you know, the Cuban seeds that's grown as a bushel in Nicaragua. And then we fly the bushel back to Miami, where our factory roll was, was rolled by Cuban hands. So the seed starts in Cuba, goes to Nicaragua, grows, comes back to Miami, they roll it, and then, you know, we put it out. We have three types, but the best part about it is the logo. You know, on the logo is my mother's picture, paying homage and respect to her, um, my father's initials, our family crest. You know, it's just something where, something, you know, something very meaningful for them. Because they paid a price for me to get to where I'm at today. I think that's great. And you know what? That rolls right into something that when I think of you, you really talk about legacy. You know, can you talk a little bit about what you what legacy means to you? And and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's very personal to me. Right. So. My I made a commitment to my family that we will never start at zero again. And that commitment is so serious to me that I get up seven days a week and go out there and do everything I need to do to make sure that we don't go back to zero. The beautiful thing is that now I don't do it out of obligation or out of uh, being forced to keep my word. I do it because I love it. You know, so I made sure that we no longer start at a certain number. So then our children and grandchildren, because I'm a grandfather as well, right? And our great grandchildren, they can actually continue to move forward. You don't have great grandchildren. No, not yet. Okay. My grandson's too. Okay. If he does, I don't know what's going on. Okay, I was gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so so legacy to me means, you know, leaving something where they can pick up and go forward with a boost. You know, um, too many of our people just drop the ball and they're not taught how to preserve wealth. They're taught how to make money. Fortunately, a lot of them are taught to be rich, but a lot of them aren't taught to preserve wealth. And I understand life insurance, 401ks, that doesn't exist in many of the countries. Like where I come from, Cuba, Dominican Republic, you know, a lot of these countries don't have these. So when they come here, they just taught to work hard. And, and I know what it is to work hard. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really want to work hard. I'd just rather work smart. So legacy is very meaningful to me. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So, I mean, you said we're at right now our mastermind. This is day one. Although we, yesterday we, we had a nice welcome dinner in my house and, and, you know, we've really done some work here. So, you know, uh, I never really have talked about the Menomines and the Mastermind and what it is 
how it began and what it means to uh, you and me. You're the president of the group. Um, so, you know, please, you know, give a little bit of, uh, uh, and I think, you know, give a little bit of, tell me and, and take your time, man. If, if, if you're feeling it, talking about this, because I know we're very passionate about it, yeah. you know, roll with it. Well, the Menemies Mastermind is a, a mastermind of men, a group of men, a brotherhood at this point, um, founded by you and I over a fire pit two, three years ago in West Palm Beach after a Tony Robbins presentation. And we and five of us sat around a fire pit smoking cigars and talking. And you didn't own your own cigars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, we, we go back to that place. I'm going to bring them again. <laughs> <laughs> and we sat around this fire pit smoking cigars and we poured ourselves out. We talked about trauma. We talked about mother father issues, worthiness issues, vulnerability, relationship issues, ego, ego issues, you know, making money, losing money, all these things that as a, a man, you you really don't have a lot of people to talk to and, and share with and and be heard without judging. So that that evening was so impactful to you and I that when you and I spoke the next day, it was like, you know, we should do this every couple of months. And then I never forget your words. You said, man, it could just be me and you and we're going to meet. And I was like, I'm in. And then we started, we invited some people. We started growing and growing and growing. And, and amazingly enough today here in, in this lovely island of Aruba, your home, we have 17 men from all walks of life from all over the world who came here to feed into each other and to be fed, to be able to lean better than when they came. And um, it's been an amazing success story because I, since you and I are the founders, I've seen a lot of these men on their journeys and they are not who they were when they started. And, I, and in, the, in the letter yesterday, myself included, yourself as an amazing example. And, um, and I said in the opening letter yesterday, take a look at yourself in the mirror because when you leave, you will not recognize this man because you will not see him again. Because everyone who leans here leans here a different person. Which has been fantastic. Which is true. Okay. And one of the things we always say, and it comes naturally, is men need this. What, what do we mean by that? Wow. Well, um, think about it. We're, we're taught to hold everything in. We're taught big boys don't cry. Boys don't cry. Hold your emotions. You know, we're taught to restrain ourselves by, by our parents and grandparents and family members, which are amazing people who did the best they could with what they knew, right? And they, and they put these restraints on us, these, you know, society-based restraints on us, cultural restraints on us, and then we're holding all this in, and then, you know, we don't really have an outlet where to, where to let it out. We can't even grow with other men because, you know, we're taught to be loners, you know? Um, so when men need this, it's like, where else do men go? Especially high-achieving men who are leaders of their family, leaders of their business, leaders of the communities, where do they go when they need to say, listen, man, this is what I'm going through. Not just therapy. You know, you know, it's not, it's not about going to therapy only. It's so we have this brotherhood where we bring these values and these problems and these, these uh, experiences with each other. And we share, we help each other elevate each other. And the beautiful thing about it is like something I'm going through, I may share. And it's actually what you're going through, maybe in a different level on a different aspect. And my testimony is exactly what you may need to help you through your journey. And yes, that's what we find happening. I mean, I, for me, I always just say like, you know, as the head of a household, as the head of a, not, not always, I said it today, I think, or yesterday, as a head of a business, you know, if you don't know how you're going to make payroll next week, it's not like you can tell your employees, Yeah, you know, you can't and, tell them. and, and <laughs> yeah, you definitely can't tell them. And, and, and listen, as an entrepreneur, you go through periods of time that are like that, yeah. you know, and if, if you're having a tough time, you know, I love my wife, but it doesn't help me to tell her because now I'm putting more stress level on her too, you know? So it is like, who can you talk to? And what I love about this group is we really share, we, we are vulnerable. We, and we're all the same. I always used to wonder like, you know, how come Robert's so fucking perfect, yeah. you know? And, and all my shit is a mess, you know? And what you find out is, you know, listen, we all have, we go through periods, you know? We have different seasons in our lives. And if we can help other people with their season, uh, because maybe we've been through it, and they can help us. Um, we, you know, there's a, a young Dutch Marine here who I think is fantastic. 
um, who said to me, and I had to bring you into this, he said, you know, he's got a deal here in Aruba. He's got the buyer. He's got the seller. He's working on the title company here they call a notary. And he's like, you know, if this happens, first off, you and I will not. Robert has us writing down words. You know, limiting, beliefs. People, limiting beliefs. Every time somebody says, if, would, all these different things, we're writing down and calling each other out on that. But he said, you know, if this happens, and and I said to him, like, well, what could possibly, you got the buyer and the seller, like, how could this deal not happen? And he said, it just seems too easy. And I was like, you know, Robert, you know, what do you think, you know, like, how how do, how do you relate to that? So, uh, you know, share a little bit about how you relate to that, because I know you and I both have some relation to, you know, if things need to feel hard. Right. So when he said that it felt too easy, he also said it like it's not supposed to be easy. And he also said it like it's wrong for it to be easy. Right. Because, you know, um, back to our, our upbringings, right. From whether it's from school, parents, family, work, everyone, they've created this story around hard work and how honorable it is. And, you know, it's honorable to put in a, a, a good day's toil. I understand that. Yet it's also honorable to be smart enough to figure it out without having to break your back open. So success, success is easy. You know, everything you need is already there. Everything you want is already at your fingertips. If you just decide to make it easier and not make it hard. The reason people don't get it is because they don't recognize it. You know, think about when you buy a car, right? The minute you decide to buy a car, you see it everywhere, right? The minute you decide to buy a car, the minute you buy a sweater or a jacket, you see people that you've never known before walking by you with the same jacket or the same shirt, but especially with cars, right? That's because you're not recognizing it. Well, why don't you train yourself to recognize that making money and being wealthy and success, being successful is just as easy? Well, because a lot of us don't have the exposure to see people succeeding easy. So then the only thing that they could connect it to is their hard work in a regular world, right? As opposed to how easy it could be on the other side. And just so you know, and I'll tell you, you know, you know this, you and I talk about it in your audience. The other side exists and the other side is great. You got to choose where you want to be. Do you want to be on the hardworking side and where you can grow to a certain limiting point? Or do you want to just quantum leap and jump and, and grow on a massive level during the same time frame? Like you pick. You yeah, but choice. we all want to do that. So why don't we all quantum leap? I'm not sure if everybody wants to do that. Uh, maybe, you, this may be true. Yeah. Um, listen, not being wealthy, not being successful fits some people. I'm at peace with that. You, you know, you and I went through something. You, I've seen you and I and everybody here went through something. On our journey to where we're going, which is a journey because we're still going, right? Yeah. Because right now we feel like we're just scratching the surface on this. Yeah, I think right? I'm, I don't know what episode oh God, I'm, I'm just, on, but I got to do a thousand episodes. Oh my God, I'm just warming up. I got to do like, five, like 500 more hotels. So <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up at this, right? But think about it. Um, during our journey and our process, we stopped a lot of reach back and told people, come on, let me put you on. Come with me. Come on, let's go. Because we do that as a community, as people, right? So I, st I used to stop, put my hand back and be like, come on, let's do this together. And I recognized one time that every time I stopped and put my hand out, I was stopping. So that's, that's very important. I was stopping. Now I'm like, come on, let's go. I'm going this way. I'm still opening the door for you, but I'm not stopping. It's your choice to come in and walk. So that has taught me those who do take my hand or who do take the suggestions and join, do move. But those who stay, it's fine. Right because they're right, they stay. So I don't believe that everybody wants to be at a certain plateau. Also, fear. But number one is fear. Even before that, right? Fear. When you tell somebody that it can be easy to be wealthy, that it can be easier to be rich, that you can make $500,000 in a year off of one or two clients and put in less work than you've ever done before, they can't they can recognize it. It sounds like hocus pocus, you're making it up. And what happens is they never will recognize it or realize it because they just don't believe it. And so, yeah, so success, success is easy, yet it takes work. Okay. Yeah. So I could do this with you all day. Yeah. We uh, have. I knew this was going to be a good one. Um, and I'll definitely have you back. But now I'm going to ask some fun questions, which I like to always end these pods with. So 
What's your favorite drink? Whiskey ginger. I like a I like a good like a Macallan. I actually like Jameson a lot. My friend Ted got me out to Jameson for some reason. I just like it. A whiskey ginger is my favorite drink. Um, coffee in the morning, black, one sugar. Start my day. That's a favorite drink. Yeah. Now, does it have to be a Cuban coffee? Uh, that has to be a good coffee. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Cuban coffee. coffees are like crack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. Yeah. Jeez. It's no joke. All right. Um, what's your favorite thing about Aruba? And you lived here for a while. Yes. Yes, we lived here for about a year and a half with the graces of your invite. So you invite us. So during COVID, you invite us to come down. And the United States was very gray during COVID, very gloom. Then you come here and you got sun, clouds, birds, trees. water, palm trees, iguanas. Now I'm like, well, who doesn't, who doesn't want to be here? <laughs> Pools, right? So, you know, we wound up living here for a year and a half. Um, we took a very nice house, created four suites. And then we had a lot of CEOs and business owners coming and friends coming from the United States and spending their COVID time here in Aruba. So they're they're as they paid for their suites, they paid for us to live here. So we kind of lived here, you know, on, on a real low cost, but in, in a great manner. And um, it was a fantastic experience. It was great. Yeah. I always wanted to live on an island, so this really gave me that. He he always would invite me, like for dinner every week. And I thought, like you know, me and my wife would come over. I thought it was be him and his lady and. Mm-hmm. It would be like eight other people. I'd be like, where'd you meet these people? He's like, the airport, the here, on the boat. You know, he loves the catamarans, too. So, yeah. all right, I, what is your favorite thing about Aruba? Oh, the catamaran. I knew it. <laughs> this guy's a, he's a captain. He should be a cap- Hell, captain. Really shot, right? Yeah, I enjoy the catamaran because it's just like you're gliding. You know, you're riding through the water, and you're just hearing the water. And then you're looking back, and then you're seeing the, the I forgot what they call it, you know, the, the wave behind you. And the I wake. love that. Yeah, the wake. Right, you're seeing the weight behind you. I love that part. It's very serene to me being out of the water. Also, just looking at the water. Like, I used to grab my beach chair and just put it in front of the water and just look at the water. Just Something about it. water. Right? Calms you. Well, I think, I think we're, 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 we're um, I mean, most of our body's made of water, so there's got to be a magnetic connection to it. It just brings peace. Well, I was just thinking, since, you know, we're going to go on a catamaran tomorrow, we should get a picture of the captain smoking a cigar. And, and Sam... What what is that called when you put a picture of me like before my podcast? What's that called? Like the picture that you you post like when you post it on Oh, the Not the highlight, the very the, the picture the what? The cover? Yeah, we should put him as the cover like this. Hell captain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, one more thing about my favorite thing in Aruba. Uh-huh. One of my things about my favorite time in Aruba is I got to spend a lot of time with you and became really close with your children. Yeah. And that was good because back in the states, we lived in the same areas. Yeah. And we wouldn't even see each other. That's Right sucks about the states is you know people are too busy, you know, and it's like and you got to go across town and yeah I'm re- truly and it'll show up either way yeah, yeah. what we, did the guy say yesterday you got to wait thirty days to make an appointment for a coffee <laughs> yeah. so last question we're still early in 2024 what is your biggest thing that you want to accomplish this year business or personal. I want to close on this uh, 90 plus unit building, which we're going to close. Yeah, you will close. Yeah, we're going to close on this building. Um, I have a, I have a great resourceful, resourceful person here. Um, we're going to close on this 90 unit building and uh, not only make a lot of money, but we're going, to, we're going to help a lot of people. Because to operate something that big, it's not just about the money. To operate that property, because it's, it's a building, it's 90 something, uh, almost 100 units, it's um, restaurants. 100 parking space. It's just, it's a, I'm buying a business. But with that comes a whole bunch of people that we're going to have to hire, help provide for their families. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful ecosystem. And, and I'll just touch on this. In my career, what I've come to realize now through real estate, I have built a financial ecosystem where everything I do in real estate feeds each other and it just keeps going around and around. It's like nature. You know, and whatever's weak, whatever's not working, the tiger, the better property, the better investment eats it up. Like the tiger eats the the weak gazelle. And then we add another one in there and we just keep improving. So this financial ecosystem that we've built, um, we want to add that unit and and even other ones like it to it. So that's like on my radar because it came on my dish last week. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know you're going to do that. You probably do it in the next two months. Um, So maybe the goal's not big enough, but... You know, since I, I don't have, yeah, I, I'll leave you with that. Since I, you know, yeah. we had a great pod here. I really appreciate you being here, man. I love you. And um, thank you guys for watching the Real Estate Doctors podcast. 
and have the best day of your life. Yeah,